Hey everybody. I'm here to introduce, this is the second in our series of the, our sub-series of the Seth's seminar series, which is of uh, our recently promoted faculty, or, or soon to be promoted faculty. Um, Fernando, Resende, um, has come to you up from the University of Michigan. Actually, you stopped as a postdoc in between at Purdue. at Purdue University, right? That's not on the web page here. But uh, I just remember the University of Michigan, which of course is where I came from. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, look forward to hearing your talk on aviation fuels from biomass. And um, if you ever get a chance, uh, to pull them aside and have them show you stuff that's going on in the lab. It's pretty interesting stuff with the uh, uh, use of catalysts to uh, break down cellulose and, and turn it into all kinds of useful chemicals. And so I'm looking forward to hearing about your work. Okay, so uh, I'll be talking um, about some of the things we have been doing on the topic of aviation fuels from biomass. Now, uh, of course, we are in the bioresource engineering, and this is an engineering related topic, but as, as, as a school wide uh, talk, I will be um, I will be presenting this material in a way that doesn't require you to be an engineer to, to understand, essentially. So regardless of your background, um, I, my goal here is that you'll be able to, to get something out of this presentation. So I, I will be focusing more on the main contributions as opposed to, to the details of, of the engineering and chemistry. There will be some chemistry and then and the process description because it's inherently part of what we do but I, I will be focusing more on, on the on the contributions of the work here so uh, we start talking a little bit about the uh, issues of the use of with the use of crude oil and the most obvious one you can see here in the in the graph the the large variation in um, in prices so dollars per, uh, per barrel over the years, so, it, uh, so the, the prices are highly unreliable. We we need to have alternatives to uh, in, in case the prices uh, events cause uh, cause the price to go up significantly. Uh, in addition to that, uh, so uh, crude oil is a finite resource, so we, we may not know how much we have, but we know what eventually is going to to end, right? So uh, it's a non-renewable resource. And uh, it's used, we're getting something off the ground and uh, essentially throwing carbon into the atmosphere so you have a, a net contribution there to, to carbon emissions. Now, uh, in contrast, we have uh, what we are proposing here is to use lignocellulosic biomass as a source of fuels. And um, of course, it is a renewable resource. You can always uh, plant, uh, plant more, obtain uh, more feedstock. And it's carbon neutral. The idea being uh, illustrated here on, on the right, so what you, if you use, let's say, a tree to produce your, your fuels and then you emit that CO2, uh, the CO2 is eventually captured by the plants again during the photosynthesis process. So by using uh, lignocellulosic biomass, you are just promoting a cycle as opposed to increasing the net amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In uh, addition, there's a large availability of, uh, of biomass in most places in the world and in several situations its use also helps to eliminate residues. Uh, some examples here of things that we can use of course over uh, DDGS, so these are residues that we can, uh, we can help to eliminate. Uh, switchgrass and things like hybrid poplar, you can actually grow those for the intended purpose of um, production of biofuels, okay? Um, so getting a little bit into the, the structure of the plant, so if you were to look at the, the plant cell walls, so we are gonna see some of the, the main polymers there that um, build up the, the biomass. So you have cellulose, hemicellulose, 
and lignin and the chemical structures of those are um, shown on the right. So it's, uh, essentially cellulose and hemicellulose, they're, they're known as the, the hydrocarbons, or, or the, I'm sorry, the, the carbohydrates uh, that are involved, the main carbohydrates that are involved um, here in the structure of the, the, the plant. And you have this complicated uh, st structure as well with uh, aromatic uh, rings, which, which is the, the lignin. The lignin is, is kind of the glue that keeps the other components together. So comparing here, now if you were to use crude oil as, as a source of your fuels, as, uh, compared to lignocellulosic biomass, how do they compare? So as I just mentioned, Biomass is composed of carbohydrates, so it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, while uh, the crude oil is, is typically a mixture of just hydrocarbons, so it contains carbon, hydrogen, and, and very little oxygen, and, and that makes its energy content much higher, okay, so crude oil has a lot more energy content than biomass has, uh, however, we have the, the one renewable feedstock as, as opposed to non-renewable. So the question is, how do we work with lignocellulosic biomass so that we can uh, produce what is called drop-in fuels, starting from something that only has carbon, has carbon hydrogen, and oxygen? How, we do, how do we eliminate those oxygen atoms so that we end up with hydrocarbons? And there has been a lot of uh, progress in this front. Uh, one of the main uh, projects that has been uh, that has been done on this aviation fuels front was actually led by the University of Washington professor Rick Gustafson here at our school um, led a, a team of uh, universities and, and, and companies that focused on producing aviation fuels from hydro okay, so and I was actually part of that project too um, we were able to go all the way to the, for like uh, growing and then uh, harvesting, converting the, the hydropopular into liquid transportation fuels. We finalized the project by, uh, by carrying out experiments in, uh, in, in Texas in a pilot plant. So uh, we were successful in that. But there has been lots of uh, other efforts associated with the production of biofuels. The, one of the most recent ones is by a company called Lensatech. And they do a process called, so they start with the wood, that's, uh, that's our, their feedstock, and they do a process called gasification that converts the wood into carbon, uh, mo uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And uh, then biologically they convert the, the, the gas into ethanol, and then there's a, a process called alcohol to hydrocarbons that will convert the ethanol into jet fuel. So, uh, Lensatech has been working on this for, in, for several years. They partnered with the Virgin Atlantic and in October 2018 they actually had their first flight using biofuels originating in Orlando all the way to London. So they, uh, they did that with a, a mixture of biofuel with the conventional fuel, uh, essentially 5% of biofuel. Okay? Um, and they, they have a target to increase this, and they want to, by 2025, so in the, about six years or so, they want to increase that 5% to 50%, okay? Um, this is not the only effort that is, so this is very recent, so end of 2018, but it's not the only effort that is out there to, uh, of, of partnerships involving uh, airlines and, and private companies to get uh, uh, aviation biofuels to work. Alaska Airlines has also had uh, a couple of flights uh, that, uh, that worked in 2015 and 2016 uh, partnering with a company called Jivo to produce aviation biofuels. So this is a hot topic. There's a lot of people looking into this and the, the goal is let's put more, so you, right now you have a mixture, right? We have 5% in the case of Virgin Atlantic. The goal is let's increase the percentage of biofuel that we can use uh, when, when, we, uh, when we work with airplanes. But there's going to be a limitation here. And um, there is a, a recent review of, um, that compared the composition of uh, typical aviation 
fuel. So that's why you typically would find uh, the, uh, the composition of the fuel that, that runs airplanes. And you're going to see that you have these things like paraffins, isoparaffins, olefins, aromatics here at the bottom, and naphthins. So it, it's, it's a mixture of uh, hundreds of, of compounds. And they all have uh, a specific uh, purpose here. You can't really deviate too much from that composition. For instance, the aromatics, they, they are a, a, a dense liquid. So uh, jet fuel has density requirements that is going to require a certain percentage of, of aromatics. In addition to that, the engines in aircrafts, they, they, they have elastomers, components that need to swell in order to prevent leaks. Okay? And uh, the aromatics that are the components that cause the swell. You take the aromatics away, there's going to be leaks. Uh, the engine is not going to work. So, as you see, all of these compounds, they have specific, um, they have specific purposes or roles in, in aviation fuels. And if you want to make those from, uh, from biomass, you're going to have to be able to mimic that percentage. The problem that we have today is that essentially all of the biofuels processes that we have out there produce paraffins as a problem. Very little aromatics, very little naphthins, okay? So we are going to be limited by, uh, by the, the, the ability of these processes to produce aromatics and naphthins. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is one route of something that uh, uh, my students and I have been working on, which we believe is going to help contribute to, uh, to provide all of the types of molecules that we need in jet fuel. And the, the key for this is the lignin. Okay? Lignin, is, as, as I mentioned, is one of the components of biomass, and we are looking for aromatics. Okay? That's, what, that's what we don't have today in most of the, of the biofuels processes, but lignin itself has those aromatics already. Okay, so we're trying to come up with something that is already there. Um, so the idea is, why don't we try to use the, the structure of the lignin as a source of those aromatics which are needed for jet fuel. So the, the, the source or, or the route that we, we are that we are proposing is, is essentially this. You start with biomass and most of what you see here is very standard in, in, in terms of what is already being done for production of aviation fuels. There is a pretreatment, enzymatic hydrolysis, so solid separation, so the, the cellulose and the hemicellulose components produce what we call sugars. Okay, So the carbohydrates lead to sugars and you can ferment those sugars to get to Ethanol. Now, ethanol can be dehydrated, you, you remove what one water molecule of the ethanol to generate ethylene, and ethylene can undergo a process called oligomerization. Now, I'll, I'll describe those in, in more detail later, but oligomerization and, and hydrogenation to get to the linear and ramified paraffin. So, so this here is pretty standard. There's a lot of people already doing that. What we are trying to contribute here is um, the, the lignin as a potential source of aromatics and cycloalkanes via a process called hydropyrolysis. Okay, so, so the idea is this, you get cellulose and hemicellulose to produce your, your, your paraffins on the left, you get the lignin to produce the aromatics on the right. So first let's discuss a little bit of the alcohol to jet Processes. So if you have alcohol available, ethanol, how do you get to make jet fuel? And the process essentially involves three steps. One, you get the ethanol and go through dehydration and eliminate one molecule of water generates ethylene. Okay, so the, the red circle there, ethylene. The second step, you take the ethylene, one single unit, and combine maybe five or six uh, units of ethylene, each one has two carbons to produce what we call oligomers or, or alpha olefins. Now, once you have those oligomers, they look already very similar to jet fuels, but they have a double bond which is undesirable for fuels in general. So, 
What we do in this last step, we add hydrogen to the, to the alpha olefins in order to produce the paraffins, okay? So that's essentially the, the, the idea here of the alcohol to jet process. Now, if you think about the level of difficulty of doing these three processes, ethanol dehydration and the hydrogenation of the oligomers, these are, are, um, are, have been done extensively already and they work fairly well, they are not difficult to do. The complicated portion here is the oligomerization of ethylene, taking one unit of ethylene and building a larger molecule uh, based on that. Now, so let's talk about the oligomerization of the ethylene. It is a process that is done commercially, uh, actually, and, and it's very well established by companies like Shell. Okay? So Shell already does the oligomerization of ethylene, however, there is a, a problem there. Um, the, the conventional process uses a significant amount of organic solvents, okay? so uh, toxic hazardous organics, and that's, that's not exactly what we want in a, in a process that is involving uh, production of biofuels. We want something that will get the ethylene into oligomers without using a liquid solvent, okay? So we do something that it, it's known as a heterogeneous catalysis. Rather, rather than using a liquid, uh, we use a, a solvent, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a solid as our catalyst, okay? So it's the solid that is shown here in the picture. And the solid, it contains pores. So imagine to a, a particle that has small openings, which are so small that we cannot even see but uh, the, the molecules can go through those dissolved. So these are the pores of the particle, and essentially the, the reaction, the oligomerization, takes place inside the pores. You start with ethylene going in, and then you have your alpha olefin going out. The, the challenge that we see in, in this type of process, however, is that as the process goes on, some of the products remain absorbed inside the pores of the catalyst, and as the process goes on, eventually the whole pore plugs, and the catalyst dies activities goes to, goes to zero. So the conversion here is limited by coking, and that's a very standard problem of heterogeneous catalysts. Now, how do we address that? So my students and I, we, we went to the literature, and we found that uh, ethylene at certain conditions, so above a certain pressure, the ethylene can dissolve complex organic molecules like naphthalene. Okay, and um, the the hypothesis here is uh, there is a significant change in properties if you take the ethylene above a certain pressure. Can we dissolve coke just like we dissolve naphthalene? Can we dissolve coke? with the ethylene and thereby by dissolving the coke, eliminate the coke from the catalyst. Okay, so um, if you think about the conditions here, okay, you take a liquid, so ethylene is originally a gas, but imagine that you have a liquid, you increase the temperature, okay, so the, the, that liquid is going to have evaporate. So by increasing the temperature of a liquid, you're favoring vaporization. Now if you take a gas and you increase the pressure, eventually that gas is going to become a liquid. Okay, so increasing pressure and temperature have opposite effects in terms of gap, in terms of phase behavior of substances. Now what happens if you increase both the temperature and the pressure? So what you get as a result, if you, if you get past a certain point, what you get is an intermediate between a liquid and a gas. Okay, in engineering, we call this a supercritical fluid. And uh, these types of fluids, when you are at those conditions, they, they, they have some properties that are typical of gas, but also typical of liquids, allowing them to be very good solvents. Okay? And that's essentially what justifies this compressed ethylene to be able to dissolve naphthalene. Okay? Now, look at the critical point of ethylene. The, 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 the temperature and pressure above which the ethylene is said to be supercritical, okay? Uh, it's, it's fairly low, so 9 degrees Celsius, so that's even uh, below 
room temperature and 54 bars. So essentially all that you have to do to generate the supercritical ethylene is increase the pressure beyond 54 bar, even without having to uh, provide any, any heat or anything. And why would you want to do that again? Because it, it provides the ethylene with the ability to dissolve many organic molecules. So we tested this in the lab, and what you see here, um, this video shows the removal or dissolution of the coal from the callus surface. So we are done, we're doing this at 58 bar, the experiment was done at 200 degrees Celsius, so well above the, the, the critical point of ethylene. So we expect ethylene here to be not a liquid and a gas, but something in between. And we have done this by one, for 100 minutes, so a little over one hour and a half. But the events here are going to happen over the course of 17 seconds. Everything that happened in one hour and a half. You're going to see the callus, which is right here at the center of, of this of, uh, of the glass structure, you're going to see the callus coking. So the, the, the coke is, will start to accumulate in, in, the, uh, in the callus, but then eventually the, the ability of the ethylene to dissolve those, uh, those large organic molecules will cause, will cause the callus to return to its original state. So the callus is coking at this point. But as you see at the center, that white is just becoming darker and darker, but then eventually it will start to clear up again. Okay? What's the point of doing this? Well, if we are removing the coke from the callus, we are also extending its life. We are extending the period that it can be active for. This had been hypothesized before in the literature, but this is the first time that uh, we're actually able to see this happen. So it's an exciting uh, project that we have there in the lab, and uh, here we see the progression of how the, the callus changes, the formation of the coke, and then the dissolution of the coke over the course of a hundred minutes, and the corresponding uh, liquid olefins that you generate as a product. Okay, so conforming here, we have the sweeping effect of compressed ethylene. So if we just carry out the oligomerization of ethylene with a solid callus at, at those supercritical conditions or, or compressed ethylene, then we're going to have the coke forming, but eventually the, that coke layer is going to regress because we are able to dissolve the coke and then therefore keeping the activity of the callus. Okay? So that's kind of the, the, the main contribution that we, we've had so far in this alcohol to, to jet, uh, alcohol to hydrocarbons, or, or the left portion here, of the um, of the process. Now we are also working on the conversion of lignin in this process called hydropyrolysis. Okay, so our goal is to convert the lignin into aromatics and cycloalkyl. So how are we going to do that? So before I start discussing hydropyrolysis, we need to we need to understand what pyrolysis is. So this comes from the Greek, and so pyro heat or fire and this is breaking down. So you're breaking down a molecule by the action of heat. So first of all, pyrolysis is different than combustion. Combustion, you have oxygen present, you can just burn uh, the organic material into producing CO2 and water. That's not what we are doing here. Instead, there is no oxygen present. So imagine there an organic polymer and uh, you heat up doing pyrolysis. Essentially, the thermal energy breaks down that polymer into its, uh, uh, into its original monomers. And not only that, you have the monomers continuing to react, uh, producing a variety of products. So pyrolysis typically provides us with a mixture of many compounds, okay? Now, a little more specific. So fast pyrolysis of biomass is one specific type of pyrolysis. So in pyrolysis, you're, also, you're always going to have Gas is produced, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, well, water. You are going to produce a liquid fuel called bio oil, and you're also going to produce a solid called cha. Okay, so th so this is kind of always something that we always get in pyrolysis. However, in this fast pyrolysis process, temperatures are fairly high, 500 to 600 degrees C, and the solid has to be heated up. 
fairly quickly. So heating rates of 10,000 Kelvin per minute with residence times of only two to five seconds. What happens at those conditions is that you maximize the production of bio-oil. Typically up to 75% of the original biomass can end up as a liquid fuel, which we call bio-oil. Now, if you just look at the figure, it's easy to see that this doesn't quite look like uh, aviation fuels yet, right? That it's this brownish, uh, dense liquid. And um, if you actually look at the composition of the, uh, of the liquid, it's very similar to the composition of the original biomass. So if you remember, we're talking about the, the excess of oxygen atoms. The bio-oil has a fairly high content of oxygen atoms. If we compare here hydrogen and, uh, and oxygen per carbon, you see at the top there the bio-oil is far from what you would, uh, you would expect from other things like crude oil, hard oil, brown, uh, brown coal. So the, the typical conventional fuels would be very different in terms of structure than what we have or than for the bio-oil. And, and the consequence of this is that it doesn't have much uh, energy to offer, about 20 to 25 megajoules per kilogram. That's roughly half of what you would expect, for instance, from gasoline or diesel. So in addition to that, you have other problems too, like uh, instability. You have um, compounds that can continue reacting over time, increasing viscosity, acidity, and a high water content. So the quality of bio oil can be used in this state as, as a heating fuel, but probably not more than that. There are some hospitals in Europe that, uh, that, uh, that use bio oil as a heating fuel, but you would never use that as a transportation fuel, which is our goal here. So how do we propose to address this problem? We're going to do hydropyrolysis instead. And hydropyrolysis is very similar to pyrolysis, so it's thermal decomposition, except that your environment, uh, in addition to not having any oxygen, needs to provide hydrogen. So you have high, it's, it's hydropyrolysis, pyrolysis in the presence of hydrogen gas. Typically what you get, uh, what you have to do is add a callus to, and the callus is what uh, helps with the reactivity of the hydrogen. If you just add the hydrogen there, without the callus, there's not going to be much going on, not much different than the, the original fast pyrolysis. So why would, would we do that? Hydrogen is expected to reduce coke formation on the callus. Remember we were talking about the problem of coking, and so the hydrogen tends to help with that. And some of it, these are some of the products that you could expect to get from hydropyrolysis. So we have aromatics, you have cyclooalkanes and alkanes. So everything that you would need for a, a, a jet fuel is essentially here, okay? Especially the aromatics and, and the cyclooalkanes, which today we can't really make from other biofuel processes. Now, the, the catalyst is really the, the key here for, for this, okay? So, uh, the, the, the specific composition of the catalyst is gonna make a tremendous difference on the type of product that we get. So, the, the support or the, the initial catalyst that we are using is called HZSM5. It's, it's a mineral and it's, it's a catalyst that has been extensively used in oil refiners, and it is used today. So it's, it's a very simple material, easy, easy to get, and it's basically comp composed of silicon and aluminum in addition to oxygen atoms. Now, what is the expected effect when we add this, when we have this uh, HGSM5 catalyst is that it will cleave some of those oxygen, uh, oxygenated groups producing hydrocarbons. So this catalyst should help us um, accomplish, at least partially, should help us accomplish our goals. This is the experimental setup that we used. Um, it is a high pressure fluidized bed reactor. So, so it's essentially a system that, that can carry out the, those, this hydropyrolysis continuously. We can continuously feed uh, biomass and continuously collect um, the, the liquid product. This was a very a uh, complex setup. It, it took it took us at least five years just to design everything, get the whole system assembled, and everything running. So we've been just running uh, running the system for about uh, two years or so. Now, um, just comparing here 
what do you get in the presence of the ZGSM5 carriers? What do you get when you have hydrogen presence and when you do not have hydrogen pre presence? So you get coke, one of the, one of the uh, catalytic products. Uh, it, it's always there. We do produce char from the thermal co the composition of the biomass. There is gas, liquids, and, and water. Okay, but one of the things we can see here is that the coke diminishes because of the addition of hydrogen. So having hydrogen there is going to help extend the life, the, uh, the life of the catalyst. Now in addition to that you have, you have the, the gases and you start seeing as you add hydrogen some of these olefins with C2, C3, two or three carbons, they, they are produced as well when we add hydrogen. So the products are, are, are moving towards the, the direction of, of hydrocarbons which is a good thing. By adding hydrogen, we also increase the total hydrocarbons liquid. Okay, and what is in, what is the composition of these hydrocarbons? You can see here we have aromatics mostly, and a little bit, just a little bit of the alkanes. Okay, so by using the HGSM5 catalyst and hydrogen, we accomplish our goal to produce aromatics. Not not quite yet in terms of of alkanes. Okay. So that's the effect of the hydrogen, it reduces the coking, and we were able to produce up to 8.9 gallons per ton of liquid hydrocarbons. So I'm just making the conversion there in terms of the units. Gallons per ton is a, is a typical number that we use for um, to represent yields in, in, in biofuels processes. So we, we were able to get to about 9 gallons per ton as opposed to 6 gallons per ton without hydrogen. But even that number is still fairly low. Okay, we would be more satisfied with something like 40 gallons or 50 gallons per ton. The, the yields of hydrocarbons, we, we were able to produce what we, we wanted, but we are still far from the, the quantities, the yield that we want. But the catalyst is the key to improve those yields. So what we decided to do next is do a modification in this catalyst and see how that helps us. So we took the original catalyst and added metallic nickel to the original HGSM5. And the expectation is that the nickel in the presence of hydrogen will promote hydrogenation reactions so that we get to cycle alkane. So we, we did this modification and the results are, are shown here. There's a lot of information, of course, in this graph, but two takeaways that we need to have. First of all, nickel significantly reduces the coke. Okay, so the coke amount uh, is reduced by the presence of hydrogen is also reduced by the use of nickel as a catalyst. The second uh, major takeaway here is you get uh, a lot of methane as you start to increase the amount of nickel. So we realize that when you have one and a half percent nickel, the, the yields of methane just start going um, through the roof. And we even decided to do another experiment with, uh, with nickel callus and the second unit which also had nickel. And we, the, the, the use of methane just keep uh, increasing. So when you have these two nickel stages, the carbon that appears in the form of methane is more than 50% of the original biomass. It's an extremely high yield, it's just not what our original goal was in terms of producing methane, this is great, but not, not yet in terms of producing liquid hydrocarbons. So we decided to do yet another modification. So we get the nickel added to the AGSM5 and uh, we went to the literature and we verified that uh, molybdenum metal and the pre uh, molybdenum metal has the ability to react with methane and actually oligomer oligomerize the methane into aromatic hydrocarbons. So the expected effect when we add molybdenum is that you're going to have lots of methane molecules assembling into aromatics. So we went ahead and did the experiment now with both nickel and molybdenum. Okay? And um, as expected, the methane goes down significantly. So the, the molybdenum did, inc did re uh, react with the methane as we expected. However, 
the aromatics themselves did not increase very much. And uh, the conclusion we had is that we instead produce alkanes. But why? Because in addition to the molybdenum, we still have the nickel there, and nickel is known as a hydrogenation catalyst. So the, we are, we are uh, succeeding in creating those aromatics when we add the molybdenum, but the presence of the nickel will also hydrogenate the aromatics producing the cycloalkane. So that's the proposed route that you're able to, to get out of these experiments here. So you, get, you do your hydropyrolysis, if there is nickel and hydrogen, that's the main reaction that, that happens here. You get that hydrogen reacting from carbon monoxide, which comes from the thermal decomposition of biomass producing water, and a significant amount of methane, okay? If the molybdenum is present, then oligomerization of the methane happens, creating aromatics. Now, if, uh, in addition to that, you have the opportunity for the nickel to act on those aromatics, it will cause hydrogenation and, and ends up leaving us with uh, cycloalkanes, okay? So we end up with a mixture of aromatics and cycloalkanes, which is, uh, which is a, a good deal in terms of producing the compounds we wanted in terms of jet fuels. Now, to conclude this uh, the section here, the last thing that I wanted to show is uh, experiments that we have been doing with the intent of reducing the pressure requirements for hydropyrolysis. Okay, so the experiments that you have seen so far, they, they, we, we've done those in, in this uh, high pressure reactor and sometimes they may have to be 50 bar, 60 bar, or 60 times atmospheric pressure, right? So it would be very interesting to be able to work with hydrogen in pressures lower than, uh, lower than that. So industrially speaking, those pressures are not extremely high, but uh, still it would, it would be able to save, uh, uh, since we're just trying to make fuel, which is a low value product, it would be extremely interesting to have, uh, not to have to have uh, high pressure equipment and smaller quantities of hydrogen. So this is what we did here. We, so I worked with Professor Anthony Di Chiara, and he helped us develop this catalyst with nickel based on carbon nanotubes. So the nickel particles, the, as you can see here in, in the, the image, they, they can be placed exclusively on the, at the inside of those very tiny carbon nanotubes, which, which act as the catalyst support. And the idea here is that the openings of, um, of these tubes, they, they're very small, almost as small as the molecules themselves. So the molecules are gonna have to make their way in in order to react with the nickel. But as they do that, the, the, the size of the opening is so small that molecules tend to collide a lot just with the walls of these carbon nanotubes. And that extremely high rate of collisions essentially works as if it was a high pressure system, even if you are not at high pressure. This is what, uh, it, this is uh, well known in the literature as a, what's called a confinement effect. You, uh, you, you confine the molecules inside car carbon nanotubes and the collisions with the walls are so intense that the system works essentially as if it was at high pressure. So we tested this for hydropyrolysis at a variety of conditions and uh, what we observed here is that the yields are the highest when we actually put the nickel inside the carbon nanotube. So note, notice the difference here, which is uh, very significant. Nickel out, when the, the nickel is outside of the carbon nanotubes compared to inside the carbon nanotube. So the, when, if the molecules have the chance to get inside the carbon nanotubes, the reaction rates become much higher. These experiments were done at atmospheric pressure, which confirms the hypothesis that uh, we, we could use those carbon nanotubes as, as a tool to help us decrease the pressure requirements for, uh, for hydropyrolysis. Okay? So in summary here, the highest use that we have been able to obtain so far, 15 gallons per ton. So still working on, on the yields, they are much higher than they, they were at the beginning, but we still have way, a way to go here. Now potential improvements will come with, with the development of new catalysts and optimization of conditions like lower pressure 
And uh, as, as future work, we're gonna, we are planning to be doing techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment in order to define clear targets, uh, economic feasibility and environmental impacts. So in summary, we discuss here a route in which we are uh, using lignin valorization. So we have a traditional alcohol to jet process that, uh, that produces paraffins, but we propose to use lignin as a source of aromatics and cycloalkanes via the, this hydropyrolysis process with the proper counts. Okay? So um, coking, we discussed coking. Uh, quite a bit, but it can be avoided by, so in the case of uh, the, the oligomerization of ethylene by compressed ethylene, and in the case of hydropyrolysis, the, the gas combined with the nickel significantly help with that. Now, in addition to that, we, we use this nickel calcium on the AGSM5, which helped us produce a mixture of aromatics and alkanes, which is exactly what we want for jet fuels. And we were able to decrease the pressure requirements by changing the support from HDSM5 to carbon nanotubes. So acknowledgements here, these are the people that actually did the work. You have a grad student, so Oliver was the, the student that started uh, the oligomerization of ethylene. He graduated with a PhD and he uh, mentored Gabriel Silfitelli, who, who is the person that is doing the project today and did the video that, uh, that you, you watch here. And Devin Chandler, uh, who also graduated with a master's uh, last year, is, is the person that did, that did the hydropyrolysis process. Uh, Anthony DiCiara has been the, the major collaborator here, helping with, with the synthesis of Kellys. And I also would like to acknowledge the funding from uh, the USDA DIFA, uh, Warehouse Endowment, uh, the American Chemical Society, and Tree Free Biomass Solutions. So this is all I have, and I would uh, love to discuss with you and answer questions. So in your alcohol to jet part, uh, you started with uh, ethanol, and uh, from there you went uh, clean and uh, optimize it. But during the NARA process, we had this discussion that it may be easier to do an isobutanol to butene, and at that route, maybe the optimization is easier. Now, I I did not pass my chemistry with very high score, so I don't understand too much of it. Can you explain the the kind of difference? Why you opted for that now this process? Um, so the, the reason why, so the, so the question is, so it, you're comparing the process based on ethanol with the process based on isobutyl, yeah, right? So the, the ethanol is kind of the default that we, we have for, as, as the outcome for, for biofuels process. So uh, I'd say that's, that's the reason why we, uh, we started with, with ethanol so that we don't have to change what is already available. Um, but you were correct in which if you have isobutanol um, as opposed to ethanol, it's going to be easier to do the oligomerization because you have, you're starting with four carbons as opposed to two. It, it's, uh, it's certainly going to be easier to get to, to any length of uh, jet fuel molecules, you're right. So, uh, but if you're Again, you, is it that product sugar if you're doing the uh, jet, uh, alcohol to jet? So from wood you're actually getting sugar, and from sugar you're, yes. uh, you're getting either ethanol or isobutanol. So why rather get isobutanol, not ethanol, unless you have an ethanol market. I, I agree that existing processes are geared towards ethanol because there's an ethanol market. Yes. But if you don't want ethanol, you'd rather go isobutanol, right? Yes. So I even know less of the chemistry. I wasn't in part of those conversations. So I'm going to go back to the premise, one of the premises at the beginning, uh, of uh, carbon neutrality. You don't have to put it up there. It's a simple idea. The, um, you're saying that this is carbon neutral in comparison to uh, uh, fossil fuels. And it seems to me that the 
claim of carbon neutrality is dependent on some assumptions. Yes. And one of those assumptions is what on the land use scientist. So I imagine that there are some places that you could grow the feedstock for this process where there's a significant carbon store already and replacing that carbon store with a rotation system that provides the feedstock for this process actually reduces the amount of carbon stored and therefore is not carbon neutral. I can imagine other uh, conditions under which you produce that feedstock on a place that has less carbon and you increase the carbon store yes. in this rotation system providing the feedstock for this process and then it's carbon positive. So carbon neutrality has this base assumption is it, is it fair to make that claim without stating the conditions under which that's true? I, I'd say it's an approximation. Um, it, uh, the, the whole carbon balance, it, it depends. So you, you talked about the feedstock, but even, uh, even in the conversion process, you can, you can shift the can shift the whole thing one way, one way or another, depending exactly on, on how you do things and, the, and even the application of your uh, of your processes. There's a lot of people that would claim that, for instance, doing uh, pyrolysis is actually carbon negative because you end up with biochar, which you could put back in the soil as uh, in the ground as soil amendment. Okay, but uh, it, again it. This is one of the aspects that is contributing. The feedstock is another aspect. The exact process they are also using, uh, it's also going to affect the whole, the whole thing. So the pressure, the energy that goes into creating the and So everything, so there's, there's a, a huge amount of factors that, uh, that, are, um, that are playing a role here. So it, it, it's possible that the process is not, is not carbon neutral, it, it's just, let's say, closer to carbon neutral than a typical fossil fuel process is. That, that, that's, uh, that's all. That's a better way of saying it. So that's what you would do the life cycle that you talked about. That's a future, you need to do this life cycle analysis yes. with all of these different, you know. With, ev with everything, versus yes. Versus whatever, yeah. It's like everything we put, everything we Output would have to be accounted for so that we actually can can uh, figure out whether we are carbon neutral or even negative or what, what is it that we are. But it, this is just the, the typical uh, assumption on carbon on biofuels processes. But it, it it's again it's an approximation. It doesn't mean that the the, it, the process essentially releases zero carbon in uh, in that in the atmosphere. But that's what that means. So maybe. Some care, more care in the use of that term. Yeah. Can, can I chime in? Uh, so I, I think uh, it's safe to start with uh, the the carbon in the biomass uh, is carbon neutral with the assumption, and then we'll see where it ends up. It can end up with carbon negative. Uh, but I have another question. Can be carbon positive. It can be yes. carbon positive, yeah. exactly. Uh, and but the uh, carbon in the biomass, at least that's a baseline. That at least has to be carbon neutral to start with. But carbon neutrality is a, is a balance. You can't have a stock that is carbon neutral. It depends mm -hmm. on where it comes from. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have an engineering question. Um, it's not a lot. You're talking about the uh, nickel producing methane, and then you add the molybdate, but then which produced the product you wanted, the alkane, the um, aromatics, but then the nickel turns the aromatics into alkanes. That's right. So why don't you separate them and do them in series? Why did you have to do them all in one reactor? Um, it, so the, the, the short answer here is just a uh, quick and short answer. It's just because experimentally is more difficult to do. We haven't done that yet. Okay. Um, but uh, ideally, what you want to have is a catalyst that has the nickel in, the, in, in one stage, mm -hmm. and then in the second stage, only molybdenum, and then in another stage, 
just the nickel. Now, there would be some added complications here because the, the molybdenum uh, has a serious problem with coking. Okay, so when you have nickel and molybdenum together, uh, one tends to balance the other out in terms of coke production. But when you, when you only have the molybdenum, uh, the Callis coking is going to be a problem there, even in the presence of, of hydrogen. But it is, a it is a possibility, and I think it's the best way of doing this, that we separate the, the three steps into, into three units. Um, but uh, in order to, the, the experimentally, the operationally, that would be complicated to do. So I have a chemistry question. Yeah. Well, first of all, I have to say, I, I actually understood your chemistry yeah. And I was really impressed by that. Yeah. Like it, that was a super clear presentation. Um, so that was a victory, maybe just for me. All right, um, <laughs> but I think it's a victory for you, right? So thank you. Um, the, the the question I have is, I mean, I think I understand hydrogen gas to to be something can, that can explode. Does it does it need to have a spark? The heat's okay. Like if you're putting it at 600 degrees. Yes. No, you are absolutely But it, right. can't it get the oxygen from somewhere else within this process? Um, what do you mean the oxygen? Well, I don't know. Some of the some of the materials that are in there, as you're going through the paralysis process, you're liberating some oxygen too, right? I'm liberating oxygen atoms, but this, this could be in the form of water. If it's water, it's okay. Yeah. But you just can't so, have so I, I am not liberating molecular oxygen gas. That would be very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess the great question is, when can we far enough from floating? <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, the safety issue with the hydrogen is, is something that we have, we, we have discussed and like all the, sure. all the requirements, not calculations for years. So in the worst case scenario, what, what could happen? So we, we, we've been through this over, over and over, and, and, and it, it, it is an issue, but we've been just uh, be careful to try to, if, if something happens, it wouldn't be um, an explosion, right? It, 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 it wouldn't it's be okay. something. <laughs> my, my question wasn't asked actually that. It was a chemistry question. I was just trying to understand how, how this actually happens and it doesn't explode, right? But now I get it. As long as there's no oxygen gas, you're good. Exactly. So, so it's just pure hydrogen. So it, it, as long as it's not in contact with, with oxygen, you cannot explain. So I assume that um, through the ages, people have used other metals than nickel and molybdenum. So why why are these two catalysts? What what's the reason why these work? The reason why so. What, let's say, why does the molybdenum help with the oligomerization? Um, that's, I, I, the, I would say I do not know like, exactly why the, the, what causes the, the molybdenum atom to, to act on the methane uh, to, to generate an aromatic molecule. I, I do not have the knowledge. Yeah, so so this, yet. all those catalysts are, it, you just happens to work and what, but we so you pick up on it and you run with it. We, we based the choice on what we found in the literature. So so there had there have been people that right. uh, that did yeah. took methane with molybdenum and they they, they figured out that they mm -hmm. they made uh, the aromatic. So, so we, we took that information and, and use it for a process. Now this spec what specifically in the molybdenum atom causes that that would be. Uh, another like, with a PhD thesis to to yeah, so questions. nobody's taking platinum or whatever and no, done something with platinum. They they do like platinum, palladium. They these have been extensively used. They do the same thing as nickel. Right? So but we use nickel just because those the, the platinum, palladium would be very expensive. Okay. okay. But it's uh, something that's experimentally determined in the literature. Or the, there must be some theory driving the explorations there too. No, the, there is a there is a theory. So, uh, yeah, the, the, so it, so you can look at the literature and, and figure out the exact mechanisms. But it's it's also possible that they they uh, the mechanisms are there, but you don't really know why the the, the molybdenum is acting the way 
uh, it is, which I bet is, is the situation. I don't think anybody would actually know what, what specifically in the structure of this atom is causing, um, is causing this to end. That's a very detailed uh, question. Uh, something that, that would be worth uh, looking into, but uh, it, it, I, I'd say it's very likely that nobody knows Some sort of exchange of electrons. Something related to that, yeah. You have to capture it at the moment, right? Yeah, they, they, there needs to be an absorption and then some exchange of electrons, something that, uh, but, but what, wh why is the molybdenum different than the nickel? That's the, his question. I, I do not know that. And so it changes into gold. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you mentioned uh, the, how complicated the setup was when uh, you established you're using water gases, really high temperature, and, and a lot of uh, conditions. So, what do you think is is it is it at all uh, scalable? Uh, do you think it can be scaled up to a commercial production? Is a capex uh, way uh, more than uh, a regular on the alcohol to jet side? We kind of have an understanding what the capex right. may look like, but on your uh, lignin to uh, uh, your jet oil side, what do you think is uh, uh, is a capex would look like and how do you think that it compares, uh, capex and opex compared on the alcohol to jet side to the lignin to jet side? So, so right now, as it stands today, it compares poorly, right? Because the, the alcohol to jet has a lot more, a lot more development into it. Now the hydropyrolysis side, um, for, if, if we can get to the point where we can use those, uh, let's say the carbon nanotubes, Right to to carry out hydropyrolysis and um, atmospheric pressure. Then you're talking about a much more friendly process in terms of economic viability and, and, and everything else. Now, if you go and ask Anthony how easy it is to make enough carbon nanotubes to put in a, in a commercial reactor, he's going to say, "Well, we there needs to be a lot of work to to to, to make these these original materials a lot cheaper. Yes, so it, it depends on other things that, that are not directly related to this process, but which would still have to become a lot better for this to become commercial. But I, so I, I believe it, this is possible, like because I, I know the the price of the carbon nanotubes have been decreasing significantly the last years. So it's possible a couple of years down the road. We would, we would come to a point where well, we can actually use uh, materials like this in, in an industrial reactor. Today, no, we can't. So, based on what you just said, it seems like if you avoid the high pressure, yes. it is more uh, economical, if the investment is less significant. Much, much less. Okay. So, that's one of your biggest, like the pressure, yes. 60 or 70 bar, 50 bar pressure. Yes. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just uh, the CH4, the fifty percent of the carbon coming out of CH4, that's huge, right? So, uh, how does that compare to if you do a pyrolysis like a biochar process? That also uh, gets a lot of CH4. But how, just no, I'm trying to get another. You mean you just a pyrolysis in nitrogen? Uh, I don't know. Just the just when you create the biochar, the regular biochar. Oh, you, you would get some methane, but uh, there could be trace amounts. Oh, okay. it's, uh, okay. it's mostly carbon monoxide, the okay. gas. Yeah. So, so methane is very little unless you have hydrogen and you have uh, nickel. So I have a philosophical Last question. question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Phil philosophical question about the whole process of trying to make jet fuel, all right? And, it's always struck me like it's, this has got to be like the most difficult thing to use. Why don't we just say, if we've got crude oil, we'll use that for jet fuel, and then we'll we'll take whatever products you can make, like the methane. That seemed pretty great, yes. right? Why, why don't we just scale that part up and use that? Or um, I, I would say that's a, a valid point, and, and maybe that's the, the route that, that we will go. Um, for instance, the AHB process, we, we talked a lot, we, we started a lot talking about the, the, the aviation jet fuels, but uh, at some point it was evident that if you come up with things like ethylene, for instance, they would have more value, make more money. Um, so it, it all depends on, again, the economics, right? If, you, if the prices of, of conventional fuels go significantly higher, then 
then these things, this process that we're talking here, they start making more sense. But the good thing about these processes is that they have enough flexibility that if the, if the let's say the avi aviation fuels themselves, they do not make sense economically, something else may, maybe the, the methane or maybe ethylene. So that there are chemicals that have much more value than, than fuels that can that uh, can be sold and that make a profit. So, so that's the, the, the production of chemicals from biomass, that's a route that a lot of people are considering a lot more these days. Thank you. Uh, I think the questions underscore a very earlier point of the clarity of the presentation and the interest that you've generated. Thank you. Thank you.